Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Thank you very much for Yoris's very blissful introductory. It reminds me of my first encounter with the notion of emptiness. I read a book by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and uh, it was the echo of voidness. Very short, very concise. And there was a checklist of emptiness, and I found it a little bit strange, a little bit familiar at the same time. I found that those people who practice this are actually very blissful. How does emptiness and bliss come together? So that's a huge question which you may ask. I found certain interesting correlation between emptying yourself and letting the world in, becoming one with the world and letting down your own self-defense. And then something happens. Yeah, sometimes you cry, you go to the toilet, you have cramps, you have a lot of stuff in your body that indicates that your subconscious is getting cleaned out. It's good stuff. It's heavy stuff. And when that happens, you know you are practicing. You're not just feeling good about yourself. So if you have any questions regarding practice uh, or how we proceed on this path of Zen, feel free to ask. So my question is about uh, practice. Um, during practice now, I experience a great sense of spaciousness, um, but I also notice that that doesn't necessarily mean that my mind is completely clear. For example, when I'm in the koan interview, I still don't know all the answers to all the koans. So I was wondering, um, could you explain something about the difference between the two and how maybe they relate to each other of how spaciousness can become clearness? Thank you. This point is called primary point. And we say it's clear like space, clear like a mirror. So if you have only space, but no clear mirror, then answers don't come because your intuition didn't kick in yet. It will. One of the good uses of the interview is that it prompts and challenges your intuition and actually forces you to let go of your ideas. Why? Because you want to answer the darn conga. You're unhappy and frustrated and want to blow up or despondent when you cannot answer. That's why it's a genius tool to let go of your own crap and then answer something from your own heart. And I don't mean just the heart chakra, it means your true nature. So the function of your true nature is intuition. Very important point. So if your mind is only space, no objects in it, that's great one level next is make it clear like a mirror and you cannot make it in fact if you stop making anything then it becomes also clear like a mirror for that we need to practice if you read Mangong Sunim's story you will realize that he went through so many stages before he actually saw that the sky is blue and the trees are green and he felt that sugar is sweet and salt is salty he went through so many things. He saw through the wall. He believed he was enlightened. He started to kick monks and teach them. All garbage. So when we practice, we actually cover the Zen circle, but not in a sequence or in a linear order. We jump. We jump to various spots, like putting a puzzle back together. Over 3,000 pieces. You can't go linear. You go heuristic as you find it. So our practice in Zen is pretty much like that. Keep coming to interviews. That will help. Okay? My wife came back to India for a few months, to back to the ashram where we were at to keep learning uh, Vedanta and keep practicing. And after a few months she came back, she was totally discouraged because she understood that attachments are the hindrance to realizing the true self. And... Uh, the greatest attachment is our companionship, and she doesn't want to let it go. So she's in between. She understands what she needs to do, but she can't get herself to do it. So it just leaves her confused and depressed. What is her greatest attachment, again? Me. Our Why companionship. Why should she let go of you? You are her husband. So? Uh, the way she understood it is that... that one-way street, okay? And it was philosophy, 
it was directed mostly towards sannyasins or those people who leave home or brahmacharis who are celibate monks of you know hindu tradition and that's why those who apply these teachings in an asian context they have to take a long and hard road to apply them correctly in a western context so what you learn in india is fine it's great original setting everything is there himalayas river, Rishikesh, curry, food, dogs, everything. But take it with a pinch of salt. And I have to use some Zen concepts here to put this into the correct context. Always perceive your correct situation, appropriate relationship, and necessary function. That's based on your commitments. So she should ask herself, what does she really want? If she wants to be a celibate nun, I doubt that, then she can follow this philosophy all the way to the end. But all these things, especially in the Orient, they teach you only the first step, not the last step. They presume that either you follow your guru, Indian, Tibetan, Nepalese, Bhutan culture, or you follow your own effort and your way and your teacher, the Confucianist hemisphere, China, Korea, Japan. Either way, you have to make your own effort and you have to know your goal. If it's lay life, and lay life means, as we've heard in today's marriage ceremony, correct view, correct livelihood, correct effort, correct energy, correct speech, correct action. So the application of the Noble Eightfold Path in everyday life. But if we are attached to words, then we lose everything. If we attain our true nature, we get everything. So when you have these very difficult philosophical concepts, or you have a problem with them, I suggest you apply the concept to itself. Okay? So everything is about detachment, detachment, detachment. But what if you detach from detachment? What happens then? You actually become free and normal. The problem with detachment is that if you're attached to emptiness, you cannot grab what you need. If I want to use this stick, I have to grab it. I have to hold it. But if I want to drink, I have to put down the stick, attain an empty hand, and take the glass of water because I'm thirsty. Some people are attached to form. Some people are attached to emptiness. Either way, it's a mistake. Okay? Attached to detachment problem attached to attachment problem that's why moment to moment what is correct from you detach from a certain karma and not get angry or upset detachment is great you need to help somebody and grab a rope and pull the person out of some water then you have to grab the rope and attach to it very strongly and use it other person too can you imagine that you pull someone out of the depths and suddenly he or she says, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Buddhist. I have to let go of this rope. I have to ditch and you should detach too. Nonsense. So the way it applies in everyday life, the way it works, that's how the value is shown. Don't attach to ideas. Don't follow just words and speech. Do not believe that any philosophy is absolute. Okay, then you and your wife can be on the right path. I hope she didn't make any rash decisions. Not yet. <laughs> can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. So detaching from detachment means that you really need to trust yourself. Yeah, and if that yourself is clear, you can trust it. If that yourself is just your ego, you're suffering and you make others suffer very quickly. Then how would you approach someone who doesn't trust themselves? I wouldn't, because he or she wouldn't trust me either. Why would I approach that person? They have to want something from me or ask something from me that I would interact. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. So it's a, it's a follow-up to Ran's question. From his question, I sense that she have a strong... Uh, maybe she wants to be she wants to be enlightened 
question, she look for it. And sometimes when you really want it, I when I really want it, I feel that I need to that I need to leave all my past behind and to go for it 100% because otherwise it's not work. You have to put your heart in, everything in, and it means to to be far, really far from your family or to not be in contact with your great friends, with everything you know, as Clear. you said. Are you married? No. All right. <laughs> And so Ron is in present tense for his wife, not past tense. Big difference. You said leave your past behind. Correct. But watch out for your current situation, your present situation and relationships. If you want to go, you have to harmoniously shut down all the flames and actually Say your goodbyes for a shorter or longer time because you actually want to save some of those relationships. If you don't, just leave. Don't say a word. And when you return, also don't say anything. But if you love someone, then just say, okay, honey, I'm going to be back as my own version 2.0 in six months or a year. That's the correct way. All right? You should get married. You will understand. <laughs> My question, I read, I read the Compass of Zen. And in the comp Compass of Zen, it he showed that most of, most of the suffering comes from the five desires, which is uh, food, sleep, uh, sex, money, and fame, in different order. You slowed down before sex. This is uh, where the question lands on. Freud is saying hello. <laughs> um, and I wanted to know what is the relationship in the relationship, what Buddhism view on that. What I read, and this is what led my, to my question, it's not good or bad, it's what you make it. But monks deal with all this four desires in a direct way and sex it's like no they maybe deal with it in their uh, mind and wishing you talk to any monks about this no i just know the vows some of you them know the vows little you know bit. how actually people handle that when they are monks or nuns no i this is why i'm asking them you'll find some very interesting answers this is the my first uh, question. Good. Do you, you want to become a monk? I have these thoughts. I d Before I arrived here, I was like, I want to see a monastery. How is it to be a monk and stuff like this? When I arrived here, I said, okay, I don't want anything. I just want clear view. You will lose <laughs> your Rasta hair. Are you ready to <laughs> do that? That's fine. It's heavy. <laughs> All right. When you really want to become a monk, then we come back to this question. Before that, you're a layman. And that's good. As a layman, you'll experience a lot of girlfriends. And that's also fine. Be kind to them and love them. And they will love you back. Then you have a good experience at night. That's all. Don't deny yourself if you don't want to. See whether it's a hindrance before your practice. If it's a hindrance to your practice, maybe you should scale it back a little bit. Hormones never lie. They put your body and mind at a very, very specific state. All right? So when that happens, you know that your hormones are making you feel good or bad, high or low, ecstatic or depressed. It's all mixed in your amygdala. And the info is in your bloodstream right away. Scientifically, it's called neurotransmitters. It's affecting your nervous system. It's so, so sad that human beings are so predictable by their hormonal state. Yes, we are. So do that. Treat the five desires as your assets, not as your enemies. You're a layman. You can do that. 
It's not the question if I can do or not. The question is how the Buddhism see the there full picture. There is no picture. Buddhism. No Buddhism. How you see it? There are people who teach something and others call it Buddhism. You know, in Korea, you call it Bulgyo, Buddha's teaching, or Buldo, the Buddha's path. Okay? There is no ism. There is no collective entity, Buddhism, and they have a general teaching on these issues, fortunately. Okay, so your uh, opinion on it? This I have no opinion on it, for all beings' sake. <laughs> have your own experience and do it right. That is correct. If it's selfish, it's terrible. If it's selfless, it's wonderful. All right? Hi. So, in Buddhism they talk about compassion and wisdom being two wings of a bird yeah or emptiness and compassion and I was wondering how can we bring those two wings together because I read teaching about emptiness I read te teachings about compassion but how does emptiness lead to compassion or compassion maybe to emptiness and how can they strengthen or could you talk these about wings are never separate you don't have to bring them together you have to take out the divide, which is your own self. So when you do that, then emptiness means you and the other person's mind become one. That's the root of compassion, not some emotional posture. If someone mistakes compassion for some emotional posturing, they get tired and exhausted very quickly. Compassion begins with truly attaining somebody else's mind, including emotions, thoughts, tension, or being relaxed. Just look and perceive. And that intuitive grasp is the root of compassion. Wisdom, pretty much the same. When you empty your own thoughts and you return to this point, that wisdom is not scholastic, philosophical or academic it's natural that natural non-dualistic wisdom is what we're looking for so it's all rooted in what we call the experience of oneness or complete emptiness or empty completeness then the mind doesn't go astray okay doesn't go into nihilism existentialism all kinds of isms just because you have nothing better to do. Okay? Keep up the good work. Okay? One of the women here talked about uh, karma. And I have a question. What about, what if you see the karma of your child? What do you do in this situation when you cannot, you cannot touch it? And you you cannot, can touch it. You cannot work on it, like yes, change it? Yes, you can it? work on it. Okay, so what can you do? Find the angle, and for that you have to become different. I know you, I know your family, I know your children, so that makes it very easy for me to answer. I'm not giving you false hopes when I say you're a good mother. I have seen it, and I will be seeing it, fortunately, from time to time when I stay over there. But you should find a different angle of motherhood. Look at your child from a different angle, open your view, Open your mind totally to find that entryway which challenges your karma. Not just hers. So when you abandon the fixed mother's position and you adopt a very flexible motherly view and you can do that very well. You know the question. So the question is, how can I help my child? Or you stay with the question, what is her mind? What is really going on with her? Then you lose the, the view that you have had so far. And I know how much you want to help her. But still, if it doesn't work, you have to change your view. Take a step back and you have to say it without breaking your own heart that if she was not my child, if she was just someone friendly's child, how would I help her? So in order to become a better mother, you have to lose the current mother's view and mother's position, and you have to expand it. And that expansion is unknown territory. It's a new challenge. And once you have done that, you'll see 
your daughter from a different angle, with a different light. And then you find a new way to help her. And I'm absolutely sure you can do that. So with the Kongans, I'm exercising and cultivating my uh, intuition. And um, I want to keep working on it. So when I start meditations, I ask my most recent question. And then in my mind, I go, as if it will now maybe do something. How do you do that? I mind? imagine the stick. Not bad. Then? N- nothing yet. Oh, good. Nothing is good. Very good. <laughs> then the hen is sitting on her eggs, unmoving, not checking. Or not. Are they warm? Already cold. So when you lift the lid before the rice has been cooked, then it's not cooking so well because the steam is out. Trust your true nature. We deliberately keep the Kongan beneath the layer of our subconscious, beneath that threshold. Because if you think about it, your mind gets very, very dirty because you cannot deal with it with your thoughts. Your thinking, your cognition cannot solve the Kongan. So you get all these shrapnels of wrong views, all these ideas, all these partial solutions. Some people come to the interview and say, okay, boom, only that version, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all incorrect. That means your mind played with you and you remember all of that, no problem. But you know by now where not to look for the answer. So you can actually ask your precious cognition to shut up. And that's why we use the question, we use the mantra, we use the direct perception of space and sound in order not to follow this thinking. That's why we have this beautiful tangent practice. Simple, clear, no nonsense. Works at all times. So it's correct that nothing comes because when something comes, it comes from a different place than just your habitual consciousness. Okay? And are there more direct methods to cultivate that uh, intuition that I can do from day to day, especially when I leave the Kyoncha? Of course. But those direct methods are so direct that they cannot be explained. Yay. (laughs) Good for you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. I'm practicing very hard this uh, not identifying, not believing my mind, don't trust... I don't, I try not to trust anything my mind projects, emotion, feelings, thoughts. I really try hard. And with that, you keep this moment to moment uh, awareness. Mm-hmm. Here, it's very nice to do because all my uh, needs and things are provided. And if I work a lot and I work a lot, it's okay. Everything here is okay. But when we are out of here, there, if I keep this mind, I have this, it's like a paradox. If I always like, it's a, I don't trust it, I don't trust it, I don't trust it, I don't trust it. So when I know to say no, or because if it's a, a feelings come, I say it's not true. If it's like attaching to the emptiness or what, attaching to the Can I put an end to your suffering? Please. (laughs) (laughs) Don't trust this, I don't trust it. Even this sentence is not worthy of your trust. So that everything goes back to normal. Everything goes back to just like this. You don't have to trust or distrust sunshine. Sun rises in the morning, sets in the evening. That's the way it works. Sunshine is capable of a few things, keeping you warm, but it doesn't give you food directly, okay? You can't eat sunlight. You eat food three times a day. So trust or not trust, put that down. Completely put that down. Just perceive without any mental comment or label or any projection or qualification. Then you really see cause and effect. And taking this mind out of the Dharma room, into the temple garden or to your everyday life will not be a problem. But if you are attached to any kind of thought, even a grain of it, it becomes a huge mountain of a hindrance. Don't make that happen. No comments, no qualifications, no projections. See it as it is. That helps you. That helps all beings. 
Thank you. We've been practicing here for over two months. And I sincerely hope that our direction remains unwavering and clear, that we attain clarity, and based on this clarity, we exercise compassion, wisdom, and help. And by that, we can make ourselves a better person and this world a better place. Thank you for practicing together so many cultures and nations, and thank you for making all this effort to attain awakening and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.